Well, this morning we are going to wrap up our series called Wired. Um, it's a series that Pastor Chad has been leading us through um, on sort of the idea that, that we're, we're wired for something. We're made, we're created, um, gifted for, for something. And so we've gone through some of the, the, the areas that we believe um, that we've been wired for. And it was great to have Pastor Moravi here last week from Kenya um, talking to us. Um, and so this morning we're going to wrap up that series with a talk entitled Wired to Go. Wired to Go. To go. So if you have your Bibles or you have a Bible app, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 16. Um, so the book of Mark chapter 16. Mark is one of the Gospels, one of the four books of the Bible that deals primarily with the life and ministry of Jesus. Um, and uh, Mark followed a guy named Peter around. Peter was an eyewitness to all of this. And so Mark um, recorded a lot of these events and uh, wrote a Gospel called the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to look at Mark chapter 16. We're going to pick it up in verse 15 and we're going to read through to the end. And then we're going to go back and look closely at verse 15. But that's where we're going to start. It's Mark 16 verse 15. So here we go. This is Jesus speaking. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. And then he lists off some kind of crazy things here. He says, in my name, they will drive out demons. They'll speak in new languages. They'll pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it won't hurt them. They'll place their hands on sick people and they will get well. And then after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word with the signs that accompanied it. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. So in case you are not familiar with what's going on here in this little passage, let me quickly paint the picture. So Jesus is standing on the Mount of Olives with his 11 disciples. The Mount of Olives is about, four, uh, about one day's journey outside of Jerusalem. So he's not far from Jerusalem, but he takes his, his 11 disciples out there um, and, he, and, he, and he spends this, this time with them. Um, it's about, well, not about, it's 40 days after his resurrection. So he has been ministering during these 40 days, appearing to people, spending time with people. And he has completed his earthly ministry. And according to scripture, he's preparing to ascend into heaven. So that's what's going on. And before he leaves them, he has some important things that he wants to say to his disciples. Now, this, this scene always reminds me, um, like, how my mom would get, sorry, mom, uh, she's sitting over here. She hates it when I talk about her in, in, in a sermon. Um, but it sort of reminds me the way that, that my mom, or really any mom, gets right before I would go to camp um, during the summer. You know, it's it like she'd cram in the last little bits of information right before I would get on the bus. All the really important information, like, okay, well, don't forget to call me when you get there so that I know that you got there safely. Be sure that you eat your vegetables. Don't eat too much junk food. Did you pack a jacket? Did you pack socks? Did you pack underwear? Yes, mom, I will brush my teeth. And yes, I will take lots of pictures. She would cram like all the last minute little instructions right into that last 30 seconds before I would get on the bus. And we all have done that. We've all, you know, before we leave the kids with the babysitter or before we leave the house keys um, with the house sitter or before we leave our password with a friend to keep our Snapchat streaks alive when we're out of service, we, 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 we want to, okay, well now remember, don't forget, let me, let me go through these last little bits of information to make sure that you have what you need before I go. And that's sort of what Jesus is doing here at the end of his time with his disciples. He gathers them up and says, okay, guys, okay, huddle up, huddle up, everybody in, everybody, one, two, three, four, 11, okay, everybody listen. This is the last time I'm going to tell you, so pay attention. Peter, put the phone down and look at me when I'm talking to you. Okay, now listen. And he says, and he says these words. He pulls him in close and he says, guys, I want you to go. I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So he says these words, and here's the crazy thing for you and I, that you and I are here in this room because those guys did it. I mean, think about that for a minute. You and I are here in this room, whether you're sitting here as a Christian, you've placed your faith in Jesus, or whether you're here sort of exploring faith in Jesus, regardless, you and I are here because these 11 guys listened to the words of Jesus and then went and did it. 
and went and actually obeyed what Jesus instructed them and commanded them to do. They went back to Jerusalem. They waited seven days. They were gathering together and praying. The Holy Spirit comes on them and fills them up, and then it was game on. You can read about this in the book of Acts, but throughout the book of Acts, you see these guys, and, and as the word begins to spread more and more, going out and preaching the gospel to all creation. And so you and I are here because these guys did what Jesus told them to do. Go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And for all of us who have received that gospel, for all of us who have received the gospel that these men faithfully proclaimed, I think Jesus' instructions apply to us now. So as modern day followers of Jesus, we inherit these same instructions that Jesus gave that day. He says, go. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now, if I'm being honest, when I hear this verse or or similar verses like Matthew 28, 19, and 20, or Acts chapter 1, verse 8. When I hear those verses, I get a little bit nervous. Not super nervous, not super anxious, but a little bit nervous. And I'll tell you why. I get nervous because I know what's coming next. I've been around churches and sermons and messages long enough to know what comes next. The next thing I'm going to hear is that I'm supposed to go and tell people about my faith. That's what always comes next. Someone reads that verse or a verse like it and then says, now you are supposed to go out and share your faith. And that makes me nervous. That makes me a little bit anxious for a lot of reasons. Some of which is because I have these images that begin to play out in my mind. I'm not opposed to telling people about Jesus. I'm not necessarily embarrassed about my faith, but this whole idea of evangelism makes me a little bit nervous. There's things that start going through my mind. I think uh, when I hear this verse, I think of, of televangelists on TV, or I think of church people going door to door, and that makes me feel nervous inside. I think of the guy standing downtown trying to shove a, a, a tract into my hand. I have flashbacks of really uncomfortable conversations that I've had at school or at work with people who hate Christians and, and have tried to make me look and feel really stupid because I didn't always have answers for their questions or for their criticisms. I even think of the really ugly examples that I've seen where people have shouted and screamed and spewed hate at other people in the name of Jesus. And so maybe this verse makes you a little bit nervous too. Maybe you're just not super comfortable with talking about your faith in Jesus. And you feel like all it does is stir up arguments, stir up division. And so you feel like people should just keep their religious beliefs to themselves. And I get it. Like I totally resonate with that mentality and that idea and that thought. And as much as I'd like to dodge the words of Jesus here, as much as I'd like to sort of get out of the way and let someone else take them, as much as I'd love to say, you know, I'd sort of love to dodge these words and leave the evangelism to the super Christians. You know, those people that we all know that just always talk about Jesus. And it's like, I'm just going to leave that to them. Like, I'm going to be sort of a normal Christian over here. I'll talk about it when someone asks me, but I'm not going to go out of my way. And I'll leave the evangelism to those that just can't stop talking about it. And it's really easy for us to create, even within our own Christian world, this sort of division, this sort of levels of like, you know, this kind of Christian and then that kind of Christian and then that kind of Christian that's going out or going on those missions trips or doing those things as if, you know, it's like first grade, second grade, middle school, high school, college, you know, graduate school sort of grades of Christianity. And I don't see that in this passage. I don't think we get that choice. As much as I'd love to sort of dodge it and let someone else do it, I don't think I, as a follower of Jesus, even get that choice. I mean, first of all, Jesus was super clear. I mean, his instructions here are really clear and explicit. And there's times that Jesus spoke in parables and you have to sort of dig in to really understand what Jesus was saying. But this isn't one of those times. Like, he's not giving any metaphor or, or illustration here. He's giving really simple, clear instructions. You, you guys, go. That's what he's saying. And then the second thing, Jesus' instructions weren't for some of us. They were for all of us. And third, here's the other thing that compels me when I think about this phrase that Jesus spoke and who he was speaking to, each of these 11 men, each of these 11 disciples spent the rest of their lives spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. In fact, 10 of them literally gave their lives and were killed spreading the gospel. I'm here 
I have faith in Jesus Christ because these men took their word, took Jesus' word seriously. And, and I can't help but feel a responsibility to do the same. As much as I'd rather stay out of the way and let someone else go and do that, I can't help, when I think about these stories, I can't help but feel a responsibility to follow in these footsteps as a modern day follower of Jesus. So in the time that we have this morning, we're going to break down Jesus' words in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, and make sure that we understand our marching orders. We're going to go back to that first verse that we read, and we're going to make sure that we understand really clearly our marching orders. So the first thing, if we can put that up, the first thing is, is he says, go into all the world. Okay, so we get that. It's really clear. It's explicit. It makes sense. But let's break it down just a little bit and make sure that we really understand. Um, let's first look at the word go. So the, the word go in the original language wasn't a metaphor go. It literally meant to go, to travel, to journey, to transport something to somewhere else. And notice that Jesus tells his disciples to go into the world, not go to the world. Those are two different prepositions, and they each mean something a little bit different. And, and, and Jesus was very clear um, and very precise with his language. So he chooses this word into, like we're supposed to not just go to the world, but we're supposed to go into the, all the world. It's like he's telling us to cross boundaries. It's like he's instructing us to cross cultural barriers and really get into the world where the actual people are. Preaching the gospel was never intended to be sort of this drive-by experience, this, this sort of firing the gospel at people as we, as we move right on past them. It was always meant to be relational. You know, we're really good, especially in a, in a world of social media, we're really good at just sort of throwing stuff up on social media and just sort of assuming that it'll kind of do its work. And, and, but, 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 but for the early disciples, the evangelism, this idea of, of going into all the world was always relational. The early disciples spent time with people. They shared the gospel with people that they shared meals with, that they were intentional about engaging and interacting with. They crossed social and cultural and, and language barriers. And so as modern day followers of Jesus, I don't think we get the right to live in our own self-constructed little Christian bubble. I don't think we get that right. I don't think that we get the right to build this little world around ourselves, surrounded and filled with people that, 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 that talk like us, that think like us, that go to church like us, and, and, and make us feel really comfortable because they all believe the same things that we believe. Ah, oh, okay, I feel like I'm at home. I don't think we get that right. We have to get into, not go to, not drive past, not lob a grenade, but get into the world and engage people who have not yet placed their faith in Jesus. Now, I don't know if that necessarily means that all of us have to travel far away. I appreciate those that do, but I think at the very least it means that we've got to be intentional about reaching outside of the little self-constructed bubble that all of us have. The second thing that this passage says is that we're supposed to preach the gospel. So we're supposed to go into all the world. Let me just pause. I, let, me, let me go back just for a second to that all the world piece. There's a passage in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. In fact, it's not on my notes, but I want to turn there really fast. So I'm just going to divert for just a second. The book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It's kind of a, a similar scene. Jesus is speaking to his disciples um, right before he ascends into heaven. And he says these words in verse 8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The reason I want to look at that really quick, because when we talk about going out into all the world, um, a lot of times we sort of think, particularly in America, Americans are, are, are unique in, in this and in sort of our um, nationalistic, geocentric kind of mentality. Like everything sort of revolves around us. And I'm the same way. I, I, I think this way all the time. When I think about world events, I sort of think about how they affect America and how they affect you know, us here in the U.S. and our way of life, not knowing that there's a whole lot of other people in this world that don't live in America. And so a lot of times when we think about this passage, um, you know, that it's going to start in Jerusalem, it's going to go to Judea, and it's going to go to Samaria, and it's going to go to all the, the uttermost parts of the earth, a lot of times what we do is we go, it's going to start in Ventura, and then it's going to go to California, and then it's going to go to the U.S., and then it's going to go to the whole world. And we've got to stop and remember that we are receiving 2,000 years worth 
of that spread. We're the recipients of the spread. It's not starting with us. I'm not the epicenter of the spread of the gospel. Now, now God may use me and certainly will use me and use you to continue that spread, but let's always remember that I'm receiving that baton from 2,000 years worth of men and women who have sacrificed in order that that baton of the gospel might be in my hands. I am not the center of this story. I am a recipient of this story, and I have an obligation to then continue and pass it on. Okay, that was not in my notes, but I just felt like I needed to say it. So I don't know that that necessarily always means that we need to travel, but we do need to get outside of our boundaries in order to go into all the world. The second thing that this verse says is we're supposed to preach the gospel. Now, the word preach has a negative connotation in our culture. The moment that most of us hear the word preach, we have a negative reaction. Either it means someone shaking their finger and telling you what to do and what not to do, or it means the pastor on the stage giving a long sermon on Sunday morning, right? That's sort of what preaching has to do with. When we think preach, those are the things that we think of. Especially this idea of sort of the holier-than-thou finger-pointing um, lecture. You know, that's sort of what we think of when we hear the word preach. So in our culture, we don't like to use the word preach. I mean, most of us don't say, I'm going to go and preach to my friend, or I'm going to go, you know, preach on social media. We don't use that word because it has this negative connotation. But that's not what this word means. The word preach, the actual word preach, uh, literally means, it, it refers to something that we do all the time Every day, every single one of us do this. It means to proclaim a message with conviction. That's what the word preach means. It doesn't mean finger pointing. It doesn't mean lecturing. It doesn't mean a holier than thou sort of I'm better and so I'm trying to tell you something you don't already know. It just simply means to proclaim a message with conviction. And we do this all the time, especially those of us on social media. We do that all the time. Every time that you recommend a restaurant to a friend or you post a review on Yelp, you're proclaiming a message publicly with conviction. They have the best fish tacos or they have the best burger like we we want to tell people these things because we're convinced that they're true every time that you share a recipe or recommend a plumber every time that you tell someone to check out a song or a band or a website or a video or a product every time that you put on a dodger jersey go dodgers or every time that you put on a usc hat you're proclaiming a message with conviction how many of you were, was anyone at the Buena Ventura football game on Friday night? Anybody go? A few of you went? A few of you went? Okay, all right. Anybody in the room, um, a graduate or a current student at Buena? Anybody? Anybody? It's okay, you can put your hands up. Yeah, with pride. Hey, Buena represented well, man. The band was playing loud. Their cheerleaders were cheering. Their fan section was shouting for Buena. We're going to win. You know, the Bulldogs are going to pound the Cougars. We're going to, any Ventura graduates or... Okay, Ventura won the game. Can I just say, if some of you are like, I don't know, I didn't, Ventura won the game. But I tell you what, man, Buena fans were cheering loud. You guys did a great job. You ended up losing the game just barely. But, but there were a lot of people in that stadium. And if you live anywhere near the stadium, you heard them proclaiming a message with great conviction. And so we do this all the time. So this idea of preaching isn't as foreign as we make it sound. But when Jesus instructs us to preach, he's not telling us to be obnoxious. He's not telling us to be argumentative or judgmental or elitist or arrogant. It doesn't even necessarily have anything to do with the guy on stage on Sunday morning. It just means to tell people to proclaim this message of Jesus with conviction. Now, let me pause for just a moment and I want to debunk a really popular myth. Some of you have heard this saying. It's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. The saying is this, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. And it's commonly attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. And I've heard it in churches. I've said it. We've, we've heard it lots of times. And, and the sentiment behind this is essentially this. This idea that, you know, Christians can often be guilty of talking too much about their faith and not actually living it out. So it's supposed to sort of tie what we say with what we do. So I, I get it, but I just need to say two things about it. Number one, St. Francis of Assisi never said it. At least if he did, he never wrote it down and no one else ever wrote it down. It actually got attributed to him way, way, way later. Um, people just sort of like, oh yeah, we'll just stick his name on it. And that sort of gives it some weight and some gravitas. But he didn't actually say it. So we need to know that, first of all. Second of all, I don't think it's possible. I don't think that it's biblically possible. Now, 
it's certainly possible to reflect the gospel. It's certainly possible to represent the gospel. It's certainly possible that our lives causes the gospel maybe to be initially attractive to someone who's sort of watching you at work or watching you at school and going, hey, you have something different about you. What's different? Why are you different? And maybe they're interested in the gospel. But to preach the gospel, which is what Jesus said, because remember, Jesus didn't say go out in all the world and be a really nice coworker so that eventually someone will ask you about Jesus. Now, that's a good thing to do, but that's not what he says to do. He said to go out and preach the gospel, okay? So, so I don't think that that is possible, to preach the gospel um, just with our actions. I think that preaching the gospel actually requires words. Now, again, we can represent it. We can reflect it. We can certainly live it out. But in order to follow through on what Jesus is instructing his disciples to do, proclaiming it, preaching it, explaining it, proclaiming it with conviction, those things require words. In fact, Romans 10 verse 14 actually says that. Paul actually says that. He says, how are they supposed to know if they haven't believed? And and, and how are they supposed to believe in him if they haven't heard? And how are they supposed to hear unless someone tells them? So, so, So we find out that our words, what we actually say, is essential to fulfilling these words that that Jesus commands. Preaching the gospel requires words, and it, in, and it demands that we engage in conversation and dialogue and discussion, even when that means a bit of social awkwardness. Even if we're convinced that personal religious beliefs should be seen and not heard, I don't think we get that out. I don't think we get that pass. I don't think Jesus' instructions give us that gap. Uh, Let me say one more thing about this part of the verse before we move on. Proclaiming the gospel also doesn't mean inviting people to church. So are we not supposed to invite people to church, Pastor Doug? That's not what I'm saying. Inviting people to church is a good thing. I hope you do invite people to church. I think that's a great thing to do. And I think that that can be one more step in people sort of understanding and experiencing and and hearing the gospel. Um, So I think you should invite people to church. But inviting people to church is not the same thing as preaching the gospel. Living in sort of a winsome way that attracts people to Jesus isn't the same as preaching the gospel. It's a good thing to do. And those are important things that we ought to be doing, but that's not what Jesus instructs here. Jesus did not call his disciples in and say, guys, listen close. Everybody in, everybody in. Okay, there's 11 of you. Okay, I want you to listen. This is important. This is really good. Last few things that I'm going to say, so pay attention. Go into all the world. You ready for it? And invite people to Ventura Missionary Church. I mean, they've got a great guitar player and they have good coffee. Like, that's not what Jesus said. What does he say? It's going to all the world and preach the gospel. Proclaim this message with conviction. Now, the focus here is on the gospel. Do you remember what gospel means? If if you don't know, it, it literally translates to mean like good news or good tidings or like a good message. We live in a world, and I'm not trying to make a political statement here, but we live in a world where we're constantly caught between fake news and true news, right? And trying to figure out what, which is which. I go on my news feed, and my news feed pops up on all the news that my phone thinks I want to read based on the news I've read before. I don't know if you know that, but the news that pops up and the advertisements that pop up now on your phone are really just reflections of what you've already said you want to look at. So as I'm going through my news feed, again, I'm not making a political statement, we're constantly caught between, is, is, this, is this the fake news that he's talking about or is this the real news? I'm not sure. And depending on what side you're on is sort of who you read, but can we at least just agree that when we're talking about the gospel, we're actually talking about real news We're not talking about fake news. We're not talking about bad news. We're talking about good news. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the idea that that God, the creator of the universe, created us. And sin has separated us from God. And so God in his mercy sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a life that we could never live. To die a sacrificial death on a cross. To pay the penalty for my sin and your sin. And then resurrected again three days later. 
and, that with, and, and invited me to put my faith in him. And when I put my faith in him and I repent from my sins and I place my, my faith in Jesus Christ, I can be saved and the world can be saved. That's the good news of Jesus. That's the gospel. And so the center of this instruction is not just something that good Christians are supposed to do. The centerpiece of these instructions that Jesus leaves with his disciples are the value and the importance and the significance and the weight of this good news. And he says, guys, this is good news. And you've got to take it and you've got to tell people and you've got to share it with people. And so he sends them out. And so we're supposed to proclaim it to all creation. And that's the last phrase that he uses here. Jesus uses this phrase, to all creation. Now, Jesus is a master teacher. And so if we believe that the gospel writers accurately captured the words of Jesus, in other words, they weren't just going, now what did he say? It's been a few years. Now what exactly did he say? If we believe that the Spirit of God inspired the, 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 the writers of Scripture to write these things, then we believe that these aren't just sort of recollections that the writers wrote down. This is literally the Spirit of God inspiring them to, to recall and write down these words of Jesus. If we believe that, then we've got to know that, the, the, that Jesus was a master teacher teacher. He didn't flub his words. He didn't accidentally say one thing when he really meant something else. He said precisely and exactly what he meant. And so when Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, he could have just as easily said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all people. At that time, in that culture, he could have even said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the men. But that's not what he says. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. It's like he's reminding us of something, something we've heard before, something about mankind, creation, being created in the image of God. So when Jesus says, preach to all creation, it's like he's reminding us, it's like he's using that phrase to remind us of who these people are, that these people, these men and women and children that surround us aren't just people. They're not just the crowds. They're not just the hordes. They're not just the groups of people or that group of people or, or the people that speak that language or the people that act like this or listen to that kind of music. He's saying, these are my creation. And these are the men and women who have been created in my image. And so that instills in them this intrinsic value and worth, regardless of their hairstyle or whether or not their skin color is lighter or darker, regardless of what language they speak or what culture they, they are a part of. He's saying, this is my creation and you as my followers are to go. Not just go to, not just throw the gospel at them on your way past, but go into and engage with all of my creation. We all know how easy it is to sort of emotionally disconnect from tragic situations and we're not connected to it, right? It's like we're way more emotionally connected when we, when we realize that we know someone who was at the concert in Las Vegas or when we realize that we know someone who lives in Houston or in Florida or, or, or we know someone who has land that's being affected by the fire. Suddenly, there's this deeper, more emotional connection. You know, otherwise, we see it on the news. And we go, oh, wow, that's really tragic. But the moment that we emotionally connect with it, everything changes. And that's sort of what, what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, remember... This creation that I'm talking about, when I say go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, it's like he's drawing us into this emotional connection with the people that we're supposed to go to. And as we, we finish this morning, I want to tell you a, a quick story, and um, the worship team can go ahead and come on back out. I want to finish and tell you a quick story and then just close with a thought. Um, most of you are familiar um, or you've probably heard of the comedy and illusion duo Penn and Teller, famous for their, their show in Vegas. Um, and Penn Gillette, the, the bigger guy on the left, um, staunch atheist, very outspoken atheist, speaks out against the Christian faith pretty aggressively. Um, it's pretty mean about it at times. But a while back, a few years ago, Penn posted a video on YouTube and it's just him talking to the camera. His hair's kind of down. And he's just talking very real um, with the camera. And he talks about a guy who came up to him after a show. He says, you know, is that the show? We did this show. And after the show, there's this guy waiting. And eventually this guy makes his way over to me, Penn tells. 
And he says, this guy comes over to me, and he begins to be very complimentary, very, very authentically complimentary. Hey, I love the show. You guys are amazing. I really appreciate what you do. And he begins to compliment Penn and just tell him what a, what a, what a great illusionist he is and what a great show it was. And, and then he kind of turns a corner. He says, you know, I'm, I'm a businessman. I'm not crazy. I'm sane. Um, but I, I just wanted you to have this. And he hands Penn, Gillette, um, a little mini Gideon Bible, one of those small ones that just has the New Testament and the Psalms in it. And he hands it to him. And inside it has a note and it has a list of phone numbers and an email address so that if Penn Gillette wants to follow up or get any more information, there's some people that he can go to. And, um, and he leaves that with him. And now Penn Gillette didn't convert in that moment. He didn't have this, um, you know, this spiritual experience in that moment. But he did say something really profound as he was reflecting on this moment. He says this, I've always said, I don't respect people who don't evangelize. And I'm inserting the word evangelize. He uses the word proselytize, but I'm going to go ahead and take a, a liberty and use the word evangelize. I don't, I don't respect people who don't evangelize. Now remember, this is an atheist. He says, I don't respect that at all. If you actually believe that there is a heaven and a hell and that people could be going to hell or not going to eternal life or whatever, and you think it's not really worth telling them this because it would make things socially awkward, how much do you have to hate someone not to evangelize? How much do you have to hate someone to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? He says, if I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that, and that truck was bearing down on you, at some point, I would tackle you. And he said, this is way more important than that. Guys, I'm here because someone proclaimed the message of Jesus with conviction. You're here because someone, and maybe that someone was a parent, maybe that someone was a family member, maybe that someone was a preacher up on a stage, maybe that someone was a friend. But we're here because someone proclaimed the message of Jesus with conviction. Someone took seriously Jesus' instructions to go, to go into all the world. And maybe that started in a home, maybe that started in a neighborhood, maybe that started in a church service, maybe that started in a youth group, but someone was faithful to obey the words of Jesus and go and preach, share, proclaim the gospel, the good news. It's not bad news, the good news of Jesus Christ. You and I are recipients of that. And we're recipients of the mandate that comes with it. And I'm going to invite you to stand if you would. And I just want to pray for us and then we're going to, we're going to close. But I want to pray for you, but I also want to pray for me. I know that sounds a little bit weird, but I do that a lot when I come up here. I told Pastor Gary this morning that when I preach, I preach to the mirror. In other words, I'm sort of preaching God's word to me because I need to hear it. I still get nervous when it comes to this kind of stuff. If you took me downtown and said, Doug, go meet some people and tell them about Jesus, I would go hide in the bathroom. Like I would just get nervous and uncomfortable. And I don't want to be. I, I want to take the opportunities that God gives me. I want to speak to people. I want to love people. I want to live in a way that attracts them to the gospel. But I want to be bold enough, brave enough, confident enough. And more importantly, I want to be fired up on the gospel enough to proclaim it with conviction. Not in a way that's obnoxious. Not in a way that chases people away. But I got good news. Why wouldn't I want to tell people about it? So I'm going to pray for me and... You can sort of duck under this prayer as well with me. God, we, some of us in this room are probably those people, Lord, that, that love to go out and tell people about Jesus. Lord, maybe my prayer is simply make me more like that. Lord, I, I'm so grateful for the transforming work that you've done in my life. I am so grateful for what I do understand. And I don't know all of it, but what I do understand about, about your gospel. Lord, the next time that I have an opportunity, would you help me to take that step and proclaim that message with conviction? 
Lord, the next time that I actually take a step away from those opportunities, Lord, would you gently and maybe even not so gently nudge me in the direction of speaking up and proclaiming your good news with conviction. Lord, would you help us to be those kind of people that, that are not just recipients of the gospel, but are mandated reporters and proclaimers of that same gospel. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.